basically, to me, what cinema is. And it's kind of a bit of a controversial topic, specifically over the past year or so. Um, there's been instances where some of the you know, great film directors out there, uh, Martin Scorsese, Francis Ford Coppola, and a couple other ones have come out and made comments that some consider to be derogatory towards like Marvel films or superhero movies. Uh, specifically, they made quotes and said, this is not cinema. It's more like a thrill ride, like a roller coaster, your highs and lows and things like that. Um, honestly, in my opinion, I believe that to be true. It's the same kind of scenario to where you have someone that is like a classically trained musician. They're going to hear things and react to them differently. They're going to have a different ideal of what exactly music is and what is considered good music, what is considered bad music, and what is considered just absolute trash. And that's kind of what made me come back to this. It's because it, cinema is one of those situations where you can make a film or a movie and it's okay, it's entertaining. Um, if it's all the right technical notes in terms of the cinematography, um, you know, the costume design, set design, sound editing, mixing, and all those things, but it's just not a very good movie or it doesn't actually expand the bounds of cinematic arts or the, the bounds of the cinematic arts. It just creates something that falls within the realm of what is considered a movie. Um, and, you know, I don't want to be super pretentious, but it's one of those things where if you, you know, if you have someone that's studied or if they, one of my things is I, I, I did go to a film school, so I have a film degree and kind of the way that they talked about movies and such were, where you had a movie which is entertainment and you had a film which gives you a feeling. It expands beyond whatever the accepted norms of um, cinema is and kind of pushes you to think beyond that. A movie provides you with a source of entertainment while a film gives you something to um, create esoteric thought or push you beyond whatever bounds you may think or you see a situation and you empathize with it and you're able to look at it and see like what do we need to do to change this or make this better and things like that. To me like that is a good film for an example. The films that I kind of fall back on when feeling down or whatever. I feel like I really just want to watch something that provides a great cinematic experience, a visual experience, visually moving, um, elicits certain emotions and things like that. I immediately go back to Terrence Malick's uh, directorial debut, Badlands, um, starring Martin Sheen and Sissy Spacek. It is an excellent film. It's, it's, it's one in which there's not a whole lot of dialogue that's necessarily like spoken in frame. A lot of his voiceover from the character of Sissy Spacek, and it is put over these images that are just unencumbered realism in a way, basically what it is. And there's one instance where there's a camera and it's just panning across the field, and you have Martin Sheen's character carrying a gun, and he's running, he's swinging the gun, he's doing various training scenes. You're able to see him and Sissy Spacek building like a treehouse out in the woods. They were living there. They're really like involved in nature. And then there's another famous scene. It's been mirrored many times after, but there's like a pan over a landscape and then it passes into the frame. You see the main character in this instance, Martin Sheen's character, Kit Carruthers, and he's just sitting there with a gun, kind of leaning on his back, looking out at the sunset across the plains. And that image invokes certain emotions from you. You can sense a feeling of isolation, that feeling of being alone out in the elements. Of course, nature is this daunting thing that regardless of how big you think you are, whether in ego or in deeds or actions, um, you're still insignificant once it comes to the earth or everything that's there, nature. Humans are just the ants on the mountain, so to speak, in terms of um, our ability to interact or influence what's around us. And that film does a good job of showing that. And it's one of those things that when you see it, you you don't need explosions because there's not a lot of explosions it's, or anything like that. It's one of those films where all of the violence is very directed and straightforward. It doesn't necessarily happen as expected always, but when it hits you, you're like, oh my gosh, like, wow, you know, that was unexpected and it was really violent, 
but the reaction or actions of the characters afterwards don't necessarily carry on that violence. It's more or less that they're detached from it and the violence is just occurring, but they don't have any um, they don't have any um, concept or actual tangible involvement in it. More so, it's just a, an action that happens without any thought or any caring of what the um, reaction is going to be from what is done. Um, basically, in the film, he you know he shoots multiple people, shoots them in the back, and then sits there and has a conversation with them when they die and things like that. So that isn't actually. For my opinion, that's a true work of art versus just a movie that is entertaining, you know, a love story. Um, Natural Born Killers is something that's more of an entertaining aspect of it because you got people that are just homicidal and going about their business. Um, more so than someone who their homicidal tendencies is not necessarily their main motivation. Their main motivation is trying to break out or live their life in some extraordinary way outside of the mundane that's occurring around them. While some of the other films will focus on more of the exploitative aspects of it, of focusing on the violence that's created and how um, it causes society to look at it and you know people to become desensitized for the things that are happening. Like in Badlands, the Sissy Spacek character is basically desensitized and everything seems to be occurring to her as a kind of a dream. She's basically oblivious. She's in love with this Kit Carruthers character. So she sees him as being something that is going to help guide her actions more so than something that is indomitable and actually forcing all of her actions. So she's more of kind of an unparticipatory character in this instance rather than actually going out and doing it like in kind of Natural Born Killers where both of the characters are kind of just crazy. While in this one, you have someone who is basically involved in everything, but it doesn't actually fall back on her. And she's just treated, oh, she's too young. She didn't really understand. She didn't know. But then you think, well, maybe she did. Was she kind of enjoying it? Was she maybe just kind of a, um, a willing participant, but not an active participant in it, so to speak? But you can kind of see the differences between when you have a, a film that, that truly tries to push the art form beyond what is there, what is expected. And this is really, Badlands is pretty much the first like famous serial killer or um, serial killer movie where the protagonists are these just despicable people, yet you feel for them and you really want them to survive. And you can see it's kind of been ripped off or played on a lot since then, along with the Terrence Malick's second film, um, Days of Heaven. And it has the, you know, the beautiful shot of him or of people like walking out in the middle of a bunch of wheat fields and stuff and the camera angles low and it's showing them walking and their hands passing over the wheat. That's like the first time that was done. Um, I think that movie came out in like the end of the 70s, 78, 79, I'm not for sure. Or it was like 80, I'm not, I'm not positive. But <clears throat> either way, that's a scene that has been completely ripped off in the past. Um, another film I talked about was The King. They absolutely took a lot of Terrence Malick's shots from those earlier films and basically just recycled and used them. And of course, the way cinema is, is once some creator makes something, everybody else just takes it and kind of does a little twist or spin on it to create a film that is going to be theirs. Um, and also, this kind of falls into films that today are problematic and you, you don't necessarily want to talk about them or even in some cases acknowledge their existence because of the material that's being depicted is obviously wrong or um, in some instances is, is blatantly racist or bigoted in terms of what is portrayed. But, um, you know, specifically like the film Birth of Nation, Breath of a Nation by D.W. Griffith is the first narrative film from beginning to end. It provides a story from start to finish, um, gives motivations to characters, shows actions that they're doing. Um, it is a work of art. It's, I mean, it's a good work of art in the fact that it pushed cinema as an art beyond what it was already at and caused it to move on into the 
technical aspects of creating scenes, sequences, um, using a cut to show something, point of view perspective. Another one is, you know, a little short film was Grandmother Through the Looking Glass. It's one of the first films to use a point of view perspective where you have a grandmother walking around the room looking through a magnifying glass at various objects uh, like a bug, a block, a couple other things like that. So it creates something that you're not expecting because you know, you're going from a time where you're just looking at a picture, it's a static 2D image, it doesn't move, to you're looking at a moving image where even something, because it's still in 2D, but this image is seen and then they move in the frame and then the cut moves over and it shows you what they're seeing so you can in essence get in their mind and be able to see these certain things and it's one of those differences that you see in what is a movie and what is a film what is pure entertainment versus what is pushing the art form because let's face it 90 95 percent of the films that are released major releases are purely entertainment only they're not really necessarily meant to make you think or push your mind in a way that makes you challenge or question whatever or maybe consider the normal rules of authority at the time or whatever is considered to be commonplace. Um, most of those films are just meant to give you that bit of escapism where you sit down in a theater for an hour and a half, two hours, and you laugh, smile, and cry. And that's, that's what you get from the vast majority of the Marvel films are these like roller coaster rides where you know something's gonna happen here, then it's gonna happen here. And then that's gonna turn from there and go in a different direction before eventually it's resolved at the climax and then everybody's okay. You know, there's no lasting consequences. And that's one of those things that in a film that pushes the art form, everything is lasting. Any, any action that the protagonist takes um, is going to elicit an opposite reaction from the antagonist, be it a person, society, or whatever. And then that protagonist is going to have to react to that reaction. And from there, hopefully, they do something that's unexpected. When I say unexpected, I don't necessarily mean like they pull out a gun and shoot somebody, because that's completely unexpected. But they look at it in a different way than what you think. Um, and that's one of those things with, with films that come out nowadays. Like you look at Dr. Strangelove, um, it's a very artistic black and white depiction of the Cold War and what would happen if you know something happened and the US ended up sending a ship out or a plane out with a nuclear bomb that drops it on Russia and then the Russians respond causing a nuclear holocaust. But it's done in a dark comedy style, um, in, dark, in a dark comedy style that lets you laugh at the arrogance and ignorance of the characters that are involved in it. But you can also be like, oh wait, oh my goodness, maybe these are real people that are involved in this. And it's one of those things, if you've ever had you know, dealings with let's face it, people that get either political positions, and it's kind of what is played in Dr. Strangelove is like a lot of the people, the military officers, are either very masculine, like hard cur you know, hard-nosed um, soldiers, or they're politicians that you can tell they were elected for their ability to speak, their ability to kind of uh, keep the peace, or kind of go in between, and not really ruffle any feathers on either side, and um, that's one of those instances where you get something that is, is truly can be considered art. Um, it's just like looking at a Jackson Pollock painting of the ink drops. When you look at an actual Jackson Pollock, you can see things that are different. You know, actually, the, the issue is, is a lot of people will look at these, these great works of art as a photo online. But to actually stand in front of the canvas, see the brush strokes, see the multiple layers of paint that's piled up with Jackson Pollock, you know, see the cigarette ash and stuff that's thrown on it, you can see the actual blood, sweat, and tears, so to speak, that's being poured into the canvas. You can feel the pressured strokes, you know, the ones that 
he takes a long stroke versus a small stroke, or you know, obviously Jackson Pollock, it's the ink drops and such. And you can see when maybe they started off with a very thick, heavy brush with a lot of paint on it and dropped it, and then he moved with just a tiny bit of paint and then dropped it over that. And you can look at it, and obviously a Jackson Pollock ink drop painting is going to evoke a lot more reactions than if I was to go out to Walmart and give me a couple little pints of some paint, um, some puff paint or whatever it is, and acrylic paint, and you know, drop it on a canvas. I'm, I mean, it can create the exact same thing image-wise that Jackson Pollock created, but I can't necessarily replicate his experience that makes the painting and defines it when you add in the personal touches. Again, like I said, the, the cigarette ash and things like that um, is what makes it unique and what makes it a work of art more so than a piece of art or a painting that I make is not going to be a Jackson Pollock no matter how hard I try. It's not going to be able to mirror or imitate his. And that's kind of the same way with cinema because you find yourself in these instances where you have a Transformers movie that comes out. You have Pearl Harbor that comes out. And they try to tell a story. In some instances, there's a couple shots that does a good job of telling a story, but there's no lasting impression. I can't think of how many. I, I mean, it, it's one of those ones, I don't know how many I've seen that leave no impression, but it's the vast majority of them. Um, another one is the, uh, the movie by... Uh, Harmony Corinne. It's called Gummo. It's like his second film that he made, or it's his, it's his directorial debut, but it's the second fil film that he wrote. <clears throat> Basically, it's like a vaudeville style film where it's a bunch of little shorts that are added together with some through story of a small town after like a tornado came through and destroyed it. And basically, all of the characters in this town are basically like freaks that you would see at a various like traveling road show. So they're all kind of just awkward and when, when you watch it, like you you feel various emotions from disgusted to, you know, kind of like you look at them and you're like, eh, it's a little bit humorous, but you, you feel bad for them, like you, you feel for them. And then there's also one scene in the film where Harmony is basically just getting shit faced drunk with a little person next to him and he and he's talking to him, he's like, man, I love you. And you're able to see um, some truth in this. You know, Jean-Luc Godard said, je cinéma, elle est en vérité 24 fois par seconde. Cinema is truth 24 times a second. And that's what you're able to see. You're able to see the truth that's being portrayed in certain instances and gain some emotional response from and that's kind of the dividing line between where you have cinema that is art and then cinema that is just cinema. It's just part of the medium. It doesn't have any lasting effect on you or anybody else. It's just something that's there. Coppola, obviously, you know, has a film degree from UCLA. He's going to approach making a film differently than someone else who is just you know, kind of plucked out of obscurity and dropped in, or someone who's not more so focused in on expanding the art form um, rather than just making a film for a paycheck. And that's kind of what you see, like, in television, it's changing a little bit now with series such as Breaking Bad happening, uh, Ozarks and some other good ones that are coming out, where the director has some input. Um, you know, in the past... The director was just someone that was plug and played on a lot of these TV shows. The showrunner would be kind of the creative control over everything. The directors would come in, they get a script, and they make their script with very little wiggle room in terms of what they're doing. But you're able to really get like the auteur ship of a film when people actually try to push the art form to show something you either hasn't been seen before or make something that lets you feel or elicits a response that's not expected. And that brings me back to, I believe it was uh, Sergei Einstein, Eisenstein uh, out in Russia, uh, creator of Battleship, director of Battleship Potemkin. Uh, one of the things that he would do is when you had a film that would play in theaters or whatever, he would have firecrackers and various things set up underneath people's seats. So that way, when something would happen, like there would be an explosion. So they were always in a heightened sense to where anything would kind of trigger them or set them off here or there. And 
you know, again, that, that's really pushing the bounds of what it is. Because at the end of the day, you're just watching something on screen. And in my opinion, if it's if it's a movie, I use the term movie loosely. If it's a movie, you can watch something, turn the volume off, see it, and it's not really going to register. You know, some explosions here, some of this, some decent camera work in terms of composition. You know, things here, things right here, things like that. Um, but it's not really going to register or hold to you. Versus when you watch something that um, is really like art house, either art house cinema or you know middle brow or high brow, right there, going into high brow cinema, to where you don't need to actually listen to anything, just seeing the images, the composition, you know, the, the faces, the emotions on faces on the people, they're able to elicit responses from you by only looking at them because you're able to see and feel what they're doing more so than hearing and being able to feel it. And that's a big thing with a lot of the Marvel films is the sound editing is always very good and music and stuff that's put in so you're able to hit those various notes. But that's, in my opinion, not necessarily how a film should be. A film should be able to be watched silent and you still kind of get the gist. You'll be able to understand what's going on. You don't even have to. Sometimes I'll even watch like foreign films and I won't even put on subtitles. I'll just listen to them in their native language and see if I can kind of follow or feel what's going on. And, you know, if, if it's done well, you don't necessarily have to hear what they're actually saying or know the words that they're saying because their face is going to emote in a certain way. Their body's going to give certain mannerisms or certain reactions. And you're going to be able to see that and understand and feel it and learn from it in the same way with like the film Parasite. Um, I watched it with subtitles, but I didn't even really, there were, I found myself not even reading them sometimes. I would just be watching what they were doing and their actions, and it gave you the exact blueprint you needed to understand what was going on because it created such a visual, visually engaging masterpiece in front of your eyes that all you needed to do was see it to be able to understand it. And... That's kind of the issue that we're at right now with cinema is because it's butting heads with each other, especially in the terms of, you know, the blockbuster is $200 million. That way films have to make a certain amount of money or else they're considered failures or flops. So a lot of studios don't want to risk making something that is more artistic or more niche focused and rather make something that is the you know, the roller coaster that everybody that's over this tall can go and get on and ride and get the exact same experience. But to me, the beauty of film is not that you'll get the exact same experience every time. It's that you'll get an experience. It doesn't mean you'll like it. It doesn't mean you'll love it. It doesn't mean you'll hate it. It just means you'll feel something and be able to get your reactions or gauge your reactions from what you're watching. I don't want to sound too pretentious, but... It is what it is. I mean, there's a lot of bullshit made both in music and in films these days. But either way, all I say is go into either with an open mind and try to listen to them, watch them, and put yourself in the place of either who made them or who the target audience is. Obviously, if you watch an animated film, in most cases, it's meant for a younger audience. So you have to kind of account for that. And that's kind of why... In my opinion, Roger Ebert is probably one of the greatest critics of all time because what he did was he would try to gauge films based upon the factors of who they're made for, um, you know, the technical aspects of it, and then the actual story. So you don't try to gauge a very intense, highfalutin drama with a animated fart joke kids film. You know, it's meant to be very lowbrow humor that everybody can catch with a couple slightly dirty things that the parents can catch that the kids can't catch. And you're able to kind of pick and choose what you watch or what you're able to see based upon, you know, people that review things like that. And don't try to pigeonhole everything into one accepted um, paragram of what, is, what makes a good film or what makes a good movie. Um, but... Other than that, uh, feel free to like, subscribe, share, and thank you and have a good day.